Good evening and welcome to episode 17. It's It's been a while since the podcast and I, I couldn't be more happy than to have the guest I have on tonight to, to kick things back off in this podcast and get going for the new year. So tonight my guest is the president, CEO, whatever title else we want to give him, an, an owner of Design Plan Services Inc., TJ Sakura. And Sakura, sorry. And I'm, uh, I'm excited to talk to TJ about his journey. We're going to talk a little bit about his business talk a little bit about his background and, and a lot about his people and his team and how he's leading. So uh, TJ is a great client of mine, full disclosure, uh, <laughs> but also one heck of a leader and someone I absolutely wanted to get on here. So TJ, welcome to the most viewed podcast based out of Wasega Beach, Ontario in the history of podcasts. How are you, man? Awesome. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm, glad, I'm glad you decided to do it. Listen, before I... Uh, get into an intro and a little bit of your background. Well, you know what? Let's start with that. I'm going to introduce what I know about you to date. And please do me a favor and close any gaps when I'm done, okay? So TJ, uh, TJ and I have been working together for probably two years and a bit. Uh, but TJ, as I mentioned, uh, owner or CEO of uh, DPS Inc. They are a land planning services company in the GTA. Uh, service some great clients across the GTA and through Ontario. And TJ is actually second generation in this business. His father, Ted, started the business. And TJ has grown it significantly over the last couple of years. And, and their team's based out of a, a head office in Etobicoke, Ontario right now. TJ's kind of come up the ranks as a planner himself, um, done the work, still does the work, uh, but now taking this journey through leadership to impact others and grow this company at a significant rate. TJ, what did I miss about your background that I, I didn't do justice to? No, that's that's pretty good. Uh, company was started in 1983. Uh, my dad was a partner with Bousfield and Associates, and he left in '83 to start Design Plan Services. Um, he was there right up until 2019. Uh, the pandemic was basically when he he stopped coming in the office, but uh, going strong. And I've worked there full time since 2000. So, you know, my dad and I were together 19 years almost, and. Uh, I came to design plan after a short stint at the city of Mississauga as a planner. So got a good base there, figured I needed to learn a little bit more, went and got a master's degree and then came back to design plan. And I've basically been running it since 2000. Uh, I bought it out from my parents in 2014. So been the president since, since then, but president chief cook and bottle washer. <laughs> That's awesome. Man of many wearing many hats, right? Yeah, I, I, I really wanted to have TJ on, on this uh, episode of the podcast because I get to work closely with TJ and his team and, and some of the things I admire and, and not to raise the bar too high for you on this podcast now, TJ, but <laughs> Careful. Uh, certainly one of the better people leaders I've seen out there. I mean, TJ and his team deliver to their clients. Um, they're excellent with strategy. They're excellent with client delivery, um, but really, really think he's got some lessons to share um, you know, at an early stage as, as the owner of this company now, relatively early when you think about it, it's, it hasn't been like you've been running the show for 30 years, right. um, but how you're doing it and how you're engaging your people, I've always admired. So I'm um, looking forward to sharing some of those stories today. But before we start with these um, big questions here, let's start with what we're drinking. As you know, I like to I like to start with a pint and call it a pint in a podcast and, and most of my guests play along. So TJ, what are you drinking tonight and why? So I'm not sure if you're going to be able to pronounce it, but it's called Zivietz. It's a nice Polish beer and I'm drinking it because uh, my whole family's from Poland. So I figured I better have something nice and uh, uh, from the old country, just as a little tribute to the heritage. I love it. Cheers. Now, how would I say cheers in Polish? Nazdrowia. Nazdrowia. Yeah. Got, got it. Was a lot of people just, a lot of people just say nice driveway. Nice driveway. Okay, that makes it easy. All right, good. I like it. Well, I I have like on these podcasts with past guests gone deep in my beer and done local and IPAs and and I must admit I was out with a client meeting this afternoon in a little bit of a rush, so I might disappoint. Um, I'm going with the Pennsylvania based Yingling Lager out of the states. Yingling That's a good beer. Is actually, the oldest brewery in I think in the U.S. if not North America. Um, only available in certain states and seems to be the ones that my family and I, when we go down the trips to Myrtle Beach and Pennsylvania and all that, on that way, I seem to get my yingling fix. And to add a little, to top that off, I'm drinking that out of a Duff beer koozie 
<laughs> from my trip at Universal Studios with the family last spring. So tribute to the Simpsons. You probably got me knocked on the beer quality tonight. You win the first question. So that's okay. If Yingling is still around, they must be doing something right as a business. It's like my go-to cheap beer. You get it at Target, you get it in all the convenience stores. But like I said, it's it's pretty good. It's a good beer. Okay. Yeah. On that note, cheers, by the way. Cheers. Let's start with a, a general high-level question, TJ. If I had to, um, if I was sitting at a bar meeting you for the first time or having a drink and you, you told me about your career and I said, you know, tell me what your leadership style is and, and why have you chosen that? Would you be able to define it? Yeah, I, I think so. Although it'd be pretty funny if we were sitting at a bar and you asked me about my leadership style. But... <laughs> it would be an awkward conversation <laughs> rapidly, eh? But... <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's funny. Um, I only... I want to call myself like the accidental leader. I never set out to run a company, never set out to be an employer. It was all just kind of falling into it, um, really enjoying it as I kind of grow into the role. Um, I definitely would call it servant leadership. I didn't even really know what that meant till a few years ago, not having any business background, uh, just, you know, education based in planning, experience based in planning and now starting to become a leader in the business. Um, so I, I would call it the servant leadership. It's great. It's I'm finding my job is becoming more and more. How do I make sure that everybody on our team has what they need to do to get their jobs done? They're the ones going to the committees. They're the ones doing most of the work, most of the submissions, applications, dealing with uh, municipal staff, our clients. Although I still do that probably 70% of the time, it's definitely less than it used to be. So I find that the, the leadership role I have is more about how do I make sure I give our team the tools they need to do what they do best. And that I'm really starting to enjoy as an add on to what I already consider to be an enjoyable career in planning. Love it. I, I, I mean, you, you do a really good job defining servant leadership. You know, as you know, I'm a fan of the style as well. It's, it's something I train. Um, and people seem to think it means, you know, you take all the accountability and your people aren't responsible for anything. And it's really just about making them happy and huggy, huggy. And, and, and some of that's part of it, um, but it's really about going first and giving them the tools they need to succeed. If you give them the tools they need to succeed, they'll drive the business. And to see you focusing on that, and I get to watch it live, um, it's pretty cool. So kudos to you for for picking that style of leadership. And I can vouch for the fact that I, that I actually see you implementing it. And I'm sure that's a big part of your growth. Um, what resonates with you with that style? Like, why do you choose that style, whether it's conscious or not? You know, I was thinking about that earlier today and just, you know, looking back on the last few years. Um, when I see the, the team have successes, and I can put them out front and they, they are the ones, you know, getting the approvals and doing something that the client is really happy with. That gives me a lot of uh, satisfaction over and above if I do. So if I can be the support, if I can be the quote unquote servant leader and see them succeed, that's very fulfilling as opposed to, you know, just moving the dirt from one pile to the other. So awesome. it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun to, to see other people succeed and know that you've set up the conditions and set up the foundation that they can su succeed from. Yeah. And that's, I mean, and, and I love that. And, and for those listening to this podcast, like the other piece that TJ's not seeing, because I think authentically you come from what you just said, the side benefit of that is you grow and your business grows. The more you invest in your time of wanting to see others succeed and pass off skills and develop people, organizations scale because they can scale their resources. And the biggest resource we have are our people. Um, and so it, it's nice when those things come together. And I think it's been a big part of your growth recently. So kudos to you. Um, all right, let's talk about where you've really screwed up in life. Let's not go too deep here. This is like, I'm not a, <laughs> but let's, you're not on a leather sofa. Tell me about a time when like, but what, what's been your biggest I guess what's been your biggest failure, if I could call it that, and, and what did you learn from it and how has it helped you? Yeah, so I'll give you an example. However, you know, we, 
we do multiple, we do projects over and over and over again. We go to committee again and again, multiple rezonings, and we, we learn a little bit from every single one of those. So it's just a continuous improvement, continuing to improve always. I don't think I'll ever stop learning. Uh, there's never uh, an encyclopedia book set that's finished in terms of planning. Things change, you always have to constantly update your skills. So the little ones, the little failures, the little learning just build up over time. But I know early in my um, early in my involvement in DPS, when I think it was one of our first employees after I had taken over, I I saw an opportunity to kind of I, I thought it was a teaching moment. Um, but looking back on it, I set him up to fail, and it wasn't a good thing on my part. Um, I had seen something that was you know not correct and let him proceed with it to the point of you know, probably looking back, he might've been a little bit embarrassed by it. Uh, it's not anybody currently employed by the company. So nobody, nobody at our firm, but uh, I thought it was a teachable moment. Thought I would, you know, give him the opportunity to learn a lesson. He probably will never forget, but it was not a good way to have somebody learn something. Uh, there was a lot better ways to make sure that I set, had set him up for success. And I didn't do that. And it's been, a, it was a hell of a learning experience for me and I've never done it again. And I know that, you know, that's, I try and head that off now, make sure that everyone's set up for success right from the beginning. Don't let the small things grow into big things. And that's kind of guided a lot of my leadership style with anybody we've hired. Um, that was back when we were say a, you know, a four person shop. He was, you know, one of the employees was the fourth guy in. Now that we're up to 12 of us, it's, um, it's easy now to make sure you're watching the little things, making sure everybody is on a real fertile ground for growth and learning and experience and that they can build off of that day after day. So that's something that kind of guided my style and has guided a lot of my decisions since then. So awesome. I love, I love the, the macro learning lesson that you just shared, but what you shared first, I really liked, and, and I'm going to steal something that you, you were saying, and I'm going to, you know, best practice, that's what Richard Petty used to call it. He used to call it legitimate plagiarism. Somebody says something good or has a good idea, you just build on it, right? And and acknowledge the person sure. who built it first and, and then make it better. Um, but I loved your, your concept of like the layers of failure, like little failures, learn from it, make it better next time. And each time one of those things happens, you're getting stronger and stronger. I almost see it like, you know, when you cut yourself and the skin grows back just as thick or thicker. Right. And you get those little nicks in life and you learn as a kid, you know, not to ride your bike with one hand on the handlebar and fart around and do wheelies because you crash and hit your face. You came back and everything went, and you learn through all those difficult periods and you become stronger and stronger. And it's funny, I think you're the first guest I've had on this. When I've asked that question, they normally go to like a big screw up like I did. I mean, luckily for me, I have quite a few to draw from, but um, you're the first who said, well, it's actually the little pieces. And it's making sure you learn from each one of those and turn that little failure or loss or whatever it means to a positive. So, so I really like that and I'm stealing it. <laughs> I'll give you commissions. I'm not sure I can yeah. charge for it, but Hey, um, talk to me on the, on the, on the flip side, let's talk a little bit about positive and, and I'm going to start with professional. Um, who's been the biggest professional influence that has helped you develop into the leader you are today and what did they do? Well, it, it's it's a great question. Uh, you can come up with a whole bunch of names and I've done a lot of reading and I've done a lot of business training. Um, I mean, without question, it's been my dad. Uh, growing the business, setting a foundation that uh, I can grow on top of. Uh, you know, it's only now that I really look back and appreciate the work that he did to get the business to where it was. Um, it, it was small business, but... You know, I had a great family life and, you know, dad was not home early every night. Um, but the foundation that he set and just carrying his briefcase for many, many years, right? Watching, being at the meetings, listening. I didn't really realize how much I had learned until I started to apply it and realize I'm saying a lot of the same things he's saying. And maybe that's just because I'm getting old and starting to realize that, you know, sometimes my parents were more right than I thought they were. Um, but yeah, he's, he's definitely been the biggest influence in my life. And, uh, uh, he still gives me strategic advice that still go to him for advice. 
Uh, he still comes up with a lot of stories from days gone by. He, he sometimes get frustrated. He gets frustrated with the stories that I tell him now of how we have to do things and the way he, they used to do it when he was in the thick of, of business. But um, yeah, unequivocally, he was, he's been the leader that I've followed and admired the most. Oh, that's awesome. I, I love the combination of professionally being able to watch, absorb and apply the lessons that you learned. Um, yeah. And then, seeing what he did as a father and a business person, and then your ability to look back now and, and appreciate that. Um, good on you for doing it now. Like I had that with my father, um, not on the business side, because we didn't do the same thing. He was a military guy, but as a father seeing, you know, some of the discipline that I, I do have, like, because I've never been a big process guy. You, you know me, I'm a, I'm a more, you know, behavior guy and, 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 and transfer those behavior and training and developing, but like the process part, is not what I wake up every morning wanting to do. But my father was that guy in my life. He was very regimented. Like we do this and we commit to this. It's being done at this time. And, and because it's being done at this time, this is what we got to do 35 minutes before that. And if we're really going to be ready 35 minutes before that to be at the arena, because you promised your coach to be at that game, then you got to do your homework an hour and a half. Like, and he had all that. And it took me a while in life to realize that the process side of me in business comes from him. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's good. I, I'd like to think I shared it with him, but unfortunately it really hit me when he passed. But you know, that's, that's sometimes human nature, right? But uh, I think I took the opportunity while he was around to share that an impact. So good on you. I love that story. Um, okay, so let's talk about this. Now you already used your dad and if you wanna use him again, you can, but like I have found um, some of the best leaders I've been around had a personal influence that had nothing to do with business on how they treat people. Um, and that usually comes from how they were treated and, and impacted. And it could be negative. I'm never going to treat someone that way. Or, or it could be really positive, like this person cared for me and did this. And do you have a personal influence that you would say shows up in your leadership style? It, you know, it's I, I can't say that there's just one. Uh, definitely an amalgam of negative and positive. Um, working for the city of Mississauga for a few years, definitely a, a more... Um, uh, deep level organization, thousands of employees, part of a big department in the planning department, um, definitely had some fantastic leaders that were there in the city. Uh, early formation of my career, my, my style, you know, knowledge. Um, and then there were, you know, a few that were not as great. Um, yeah, you can, you can tell the lessons. I mean, I remember hearing one of the managers openly tell someone that they, uh, are never going to have a career in this chosen in their chosen field, and I thought, well, what kind of a manager really tells somebody that? Now, maybe it was just brutal honesty, and it helped that person. I have no idea, you know, where it went after that. Um, but some good and bad managers. Uh, when I started really getting into the running of the business, I had to do a lot of reading. I don't have a background or education in business. Um, hiring you has been a big help. Oh. And you definitely have a leadership style that I draw on some of the examples you provide. So that's, that's a good source, but then just doing a lot of reading. I mean, you know, you, you think about the classics, Adam Grant, Simon Sinek, um, I have Robert Greenleaf going back even quite far. Yes. I said you already. <laughs> the 50 year old millennial. <laughs> yeah. The 50 year old millennial was one of my earlier books. I, it, I think it was maybe when we were talking about working together that I actually bought and read it. So yeah. Uh, gave me a little background and insight. We definitely use those uh, tactics and, and uh, methods in our business. So definitely an influence. Another influence is um, someone kind of outside our scope is um, he's a Canadian pilot and astronaut, Chris Hadfield. And he's got a great style, uh, leadership. He has one story. This is just a funny little anecdote. Um, when he was a young kid, he wanted to be an astronaut. Now, what is a young kid, you know, 10 years old? First of all, what are the chances of being an astronaut? You're a Canadian. Number two, what do you do as a 10 year old to become mm -hmm. an astronaut? But then he said, he goes, every single decision I made, I would think what would get me this much closer to my goal of being an astronaut? And so he would say, he'd sit down for dinner. Would an astronaut eat the carrot or would an astronaut eat the cookie or the cake? Which one should I choose? And he just used that kind of throughout his career. And it's a good little methodology you know, the little choices and the little choices you make going forward, just pile up and add up to, 
where you want to be. And, uh, you know, did I ever think I'd be running a business of, of this size at my age? Uh, no, it wasn't kind of a goal, but it's definitely gone in the right direction. And I try and make the decisions now that, uh, that are good. So a lot of leadership influences, um, professional experienced reading, and then just, uh, you know, working with you to make the business better every day. Awesome. So leadership lessons from an astronaut, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, now I'm assuming the carrot wasn't left on the plate. He made the right decision and ate the carrot, right? But in, in all seriousness, on that point, I mean, when when you think about it, you know, we often talk about, you know, here's the result we want, but it's the behaviors that make the difference. Yeah. It is the cookie or the carrot, and leadership is going to be there to draw up what the menu looks like. Now, now the individual has to decide: Am I eating the cookie or the carrot? If that makes sense, right? We we, we talk a lot about that. And I talk about it a lot of my clients is if you want to return, you got to be able to identify the path. And once yeah. you've done that, you got to set people up to be able to succeed in that path and make their own decisions to get there. So I love that, that, that drawing from past professional at the city, Chris Hadfield book reading. It's a nice compliment of, of um, influences. So let's talk um, a little bit about the recent, and I, this is live podcasting i'm going to close my office door as my kids are playing mini sticks outside my office right now so let's <laughs> do a second pause here sure all right yeah i know what it's like to be in a noisy house sometimes <laughs> they got one of these yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah or it's when they it's when they think you can't hear them but you can hear them and they think they're talking quietly, but they're not. Yeah, they had no idea dad was recording a podcast. So in fairness <laughs> to them, um, yeah. always hockey around this household, even when it's on your knees in the basement. So let's, yeah. let's shift okay. a little, let's shift a little bit to now. So like you've had some success. Um, you've had some success from your leadership style. You've had some success from strategic decisions. Um, let's talk about some recent highlights from your career. Can you give us an example where you feel like Leadership and strategy played into that business success over the last year or two. Is there something you can share with the group that you've you've changed, you've done that's influenced the team to influence the result? And, and where does leadership and strategy fit in? Yeah, it's it's so tough to think of an example. I mean, all I can say is when I see our team succeeding, and I mean, it's obviously a business. We're we're in it to um, make sure everybody gets paid. You know, it's it's running a business. We hope we provide a good service. I mean, that's number one. As long as we provide a good service, then the rest should follow. But to see our, our team succeed, and I'll give you just one quick example. He'll probably know who it is. I won't name him. But um, one of our planners was um, in, in a pretty, pretty controversial application, pretty controversial proposal, and eventually got it all approved. And he was physically jumping up and down in the hallway of the office. And to see that, like, that's just a, a great example of when I see our team succeed. And I, I can't even say that I, you know, directly contributed to his success, but there's got to be something there. And to see the team getting engaged and contributing and starting to kind of take on the, the responsibilities on their own is, uh, is really, really rewarding in, in the job. Uh, running the business is getting really to be a lot of fun. Yeah. When you see the, the staff succeeding and having fun. And uh, one thing I, I probably should have mentioned earlier, I just wanted to, to make sure is um, there's always this debate I find in the books, in the business, in the academia about um, what's more important to business, your, your clients, customers, or your people, your staff. And to me, it's like, almost easy to say it's our people without our people doing good work. We would have no clients. It doesn't matter how many clients you had. If, if you don't provide a product that means something, if you don't have output, that means something, then nobody's going to buy it from you. So to have the, the team that we put together, the hiring decisions are the most critical, get those people on board. That just breeds uh, an environment of success. And I think that's really the reason why we've seen a lot of growth in our in our business. Yeah, and you've done a you've done a really good job. Of, if I can, um, you know, be a fan of a client for a moment, you've done a really good job 
investing in investing in developing your team and, and having a pathway of, you know, student, junior, senior, and, and, and off they go through the organization, but more, you've clearly aligned what the learning opportunities are from get, to get from one level to the next. Um, and it has people aspiring to be a part of it. I've seen that. And I think that's a big part of your success. On that note, um, without, you know, going too deep into that success, but you're, you're experiencing some significant growth. Your, your company's yep. grown um, relatively rapidly over the last few years. Yep. What's causing that? What's at the root of that growth, would you say? What can, what can you share with others if they're in same situation you were and want to get that exponential growth that you've achieved? Yeah, I, I really think it's just being built on a foundation of uh, we're, our people, we're, everybody, we're doing good work. Uh, word of mouth is a lot of our business development. Uh, you know, if you get a good reputation in this industry, uh, it, it can serve you well. Uh, likewise, the other side of that coin is if you get a bad reputation, you're going to be in trouble very quickly. It's um, funny when I speak to young planners or people just entering their career, we have a mentorship program through OPPI and I um, have attended a lot of functions through OPPI just to, you know, to bring young planners into the career. And I, the first, one of the first things I say to them is, this is a small industry. Everybody knows, if you don't know somebody directly, you know of them. And so making a good reputation for yourself, being ethical, being uh, working with integrity, that's critical. And I like to think that that's added a lot to our growth and why clients are coming to us. They're coming to us because we do job a, a good job. We do the work ethically with integrity. We are open and transparent with our clients. We make sure that everything's on the table. I like to be open and transparent with everybody we deal with being municipal and agency staff. Um, some other planners don't have that style. They're a little more um, aggressive or a little more pound the table style. And I dealt with it when I was at the city of Mississauga. And sometimes it's, it has the same outcome. Projects get approved. But I would attribute our growth a lot to the fact that um, we want to make sure that we serve our clients in the way they need to be served. And that just draws more clients. Yeah, it's it's funny. One of the first things we talked about when I was trying to define, you know, what your offering look like to your clients and your differentiators. And, and one of the things you said was like urgency and, and speed of response yeah. and availability and and, and in your industry, that's so critical. Um, you know, Time is money, yeah. Well, builders are sitting on land. They needed to move quick. They've got to get approvals. They've got to get stuff in. They've got to coordinate trades. They've got to do, like getting that through successfully is critical. And to your point, it means, it means dollars. But more importantly, let your clients know that you're top of the line, even though you got tons of clients to make top of the line, just that simple behavior of showing an urgent response makes a client know that you're in their corner. Uh, and you guys demonstrate that. Um, where does strategic planning fall in your leadership toolkit and how much has that played a role in your growth over the last few years? Yeah, it, it's been critical. Uh, just having a path and defining a path. You can always deviate from it. You can always bob and weave as you start to go down the path of building uh, the, the operations, the functions, the, the components of the business that will allow you to service your clients. Um, but putting it all down on paper, setting it out in a strategic way, uh, having people responsible for certain tasks, assigning champions. Uh, we see staff step up to the plate when we uh, discuss the strategic plan with them and involve them in the process that they will take on pieces that I didn't think they were interested in taking on. And that's a great thing too. So the strategic planning has been, has been key in our growth and development and having our operations run properly and, you know, just our administration systems, making sure everything is not distracting us from the job we're meant to do. I kind of liken it to going to a really nice restaurant. And if the service is really good, you don't notice the service, mm. right? If you've set up the position, if you've set up the way that you operate and if that server is knows what they're doing, serves you properly, you don't even really notice the service because it's just so good. You're there to be with whoever you're having a meal with, but the service is a critical component, but you don't want it to be intrusive. So 
And in our business, making sure that we have all of that set up, we know what we're doing, we're serving our clients, and hopefully we just buzz through the process, get the approvals, get the projects rolling, and they don't even really notice how hard or how much we did for them because all those systems were in place and strategic planning is is key in that, in setting all that up. Yeah, I, lo I love that you touched on the fact that, you know, you're it's nice to see people you think wouldn't want to be engaged in something in the plan are. Um, and the biggest compliment I can give you is that, you know, you bring your entire team into that process. You know, you, you brought your entire team into the SWAT process to be a part of that um, entire cycle of idea generation of where you're strong, where you're weak, where your opportunities, where your threats were. And they had an impact when you brought it to the executive team to build it. And then it's no surprise when you bring it back down to get it implemented, the team feels engaged and they want to see the business grow. It's funny. It's one of the lessons I learned early in retail is like, uh, I had a district manager named Mark McRae and he would come into the store and I was this like 17 year old kid in St. Bruno, Quebec. And he'd be like, you know, Hey Mark, what do you need? Like, how am I, how am I going to help you get more sales next week? And I'm thinking, this district manager in Ontario cares about this 17 year old kid's opinion in the business. And it wasn't my commission or my paycheck that drove me. What drove me is Mark felt like I was a part of the business. And when I'd give him feedback on what I needed and he delivered, I made sure I was gonna be a part of that solution and drive the results. And we often think junior staff, all the staff, they don't want that burden. Um, they want to be involved if they're not being paid for it or if it's not part of their job. It's quite the reverse. Everyone wants to be engaged in helping a company grow. And, and your team demonstrated that. It's been a really, really great to watch. And I think it's a big part of your success. Um, and it's a lot of fun. I mean, everybody has something to offer. And, and frankly, as a leader, trying to figure out what everybody has to offer, maybe they have something to offer that is not part of their job description and giving them the opportunities and then I just equate it to that old saying, a rising tide lifts all ships, right? Every, everybody does well. If the company does well, everybody's going to do well. Yep. Growth impacts everyone at some yep. point. Um, and it's important to engage everyone to create that growth. And, and I think you guys are demonstrating that. Talked a little bit about it. And if it's the same answer, is that fine? But I, I'd like to give you the opportunity. Like professional leadership influencers, you mentioned some authors. Are there some... Um, books, courses, videos that you follow, anything you think the audience uh, needs to be aware of that you've learned from other than I think you should Simon Sinek and a couple other. Yeah, and, yeah, nothing in a, in a formal uh, learning kind of way. But I mean, going back probably to an early time when I was taking over the company, I remember going to chapters in Ajax. I had a little bit of time before a meeting, thought, you know, what can I do? Went into chapters and I picked up I've never heard of him before, Napoleon Hill and Think and Grow Rich. And, I, you know, you read the book and it's got some funny stories and it's from the, the 50s. So it's, it's, you know, not all applicable to now, but what a great book about the way you set your mind is the, the, what, the way you're going to go. What you're going to get out of it is where you set your mind to think and then make it happen. So that was a great one. Um, you know, there's the, there's the Carnegie's, there's the Covey's. Like the, that stuff is all great stuff. A uh, lot of learning out of those guys. Um, you know, I'm, I was born, I feel old, but I was not born early enough to be seeing them in their, in their prime or actually going to do like Dale Carnegie courses with Dale Carnegie. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of influence from those kind of professionals in, in business and in, in leadership. Awesome. Um, if you had to, uh, well, I don't want to. I don't want to narrow you down to one scenario. But as an example, if 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 someone else is like TJ, taking over a business from their father that they've worked in, and and got to take it to the next level, um, what words of wisdom would you give someone trying to develop their path the way you have over the past few years? How you fast forward yeah, someone's success? It's 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 funny. Like I don't even realize anybody's gonna ask me that question, who's looking for advice from me? But then I realized, okay, you know, we're running a pretty good business here. And if I had any words of wisdom to offer, I'd say, you got to find your why. Why are you doing what you do? Why do you go to work every day? I mean, we all go for a paycheck to some extent, but that's definitely not going to keep you going. It's not going to make you excited and it's not going to make you give that little bit extra. So if you find your why, figure out what, why you're doing what you do. Um, you know, we're in the planning profession and our business, we're working, you know, sometimes three, five, 10 years ahead of, 
a shovel being in the ground on a project, maybe even longer. And all we have to keep in mind is like we deal with one of the three necessities of life, which is shelter. And so for me, my why and, and what I found out, and it's helped me focus my efforts is, I mean, we're, we're involved in the house building process. We're involved in, in making homes for people. I like to say, and this may be a little, uh, some people might think this is a little bit arrogant of our profession is there's, I don't think I know of any other profession that touches every single human, every single minute of every single day. Everybody lives, works and plays, no matter where you're doing it. Sometime in the past, there was some planner looking at that space, whether it's where you work, whether it's where you live, whether it's where you recreate and said, that space should be programmed in a certain way. The physical environment should be shaped. And that influences and affects how everybody acts. So that's, that's my why. I want to make sure that I'm creating environments, homes for people that when you raise your family, you never think there was a planner putting your house on your lot 20 years ago, 10 years ago, but there was, there was somebody. And so you hope that that somebody gave some thought to it that made a positive influence. And, and the other thing too is day to day, it's a choice, right? You have to choose to be happy. You have to choose to love what you do. I am so excited every morning to get up out of bed and go to work. Uh, I, I can't explain the feeling of how, how much fun it is. And to see the, the staff running around, busy, achieving things, meeting with clients, it's a real joy. So any words of wisdom are make sure you know why you're doing what you do. Do it for a good reason. Hopefully you're doing something you enjoy. And, and make the choice. Make the choice to enjoy it. And if you don't enjoy it, I always like to say you have a choice. Do something else. Do something you enjoy. Because what I don't even know who made who said that old saying, uh, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah, I know. I know. Who do we give credit to for that? Because you hear it all the time, right? <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, it was, certainly wasn't me either. <laughs> it was someone else. <laughs> so that that rings true and yeah. uh, it's so much fun to go to work every day and even doing emails and, and looking at your phone at, at 10 o'clock 11 o'clock at night or six o'clock in the morning it's it's no big deal if you're having fun doing it yeah agreed awesome all right last couple of questions and you've been super generous with your time thanks for doing this um no worries Let's talk a little bit about DPS. So, so what's going on at DPS? Any recent news? Anything you would want someone in the audience to know if they're a home builder listening to this or, or anyone in your industry? Talk to us a, like a proud papa and boast a little bit here and tell us about your team and what's going on. Yeah, it's amazing because, you know, when you, you interview for jobs when you're young, people say, okay, tell me about yourself. And the last thing I like to do is sell us sell myself but it's definitely a part of business we're all sales people at some level um we're we're growing pretty rapidly we got a lot of good people in our office we're um we can expand geographically one thing that we've just recently brought into the fold is we can now offer um, urban design services so urban design is kind of a corollary i see it as a corollary as part of a multidisciplinary team to projects we work on. So doing planning and urban design out of our office is uh, pretty new and pretty exciting uh, to offer that out to our clients, uh, existing clients, and then anybody who's looking for urban design services. So that's that's a pretty exciting thing we're, we're going into. Um, in terms of the company as it exists, we can deal with any de land development project from due diligence or inve property investigation all the way through to shovel in the ground, pulling permits. We work everywhere from Windsor to Ottawa to Timmins. So that's our kind of geographic area, although we can work anywhere in Ontario, um, you know, any, any municipality. We deal with almost every municipality in, Mon in Ontario. Uh, we're in regions, districts. We deal with upper tier, lower tier, single tier municipalities. Uh, we deal with the province. I actually have a, a provincial court case coming up on a planning matter. Uh, probably early in the new year. And so it, it, it's an exciting time. Uh, we're just taking on more work. We we're fortunate that uh, in our industry, especially on the private side of the equation, the private sector, we have the ability to staff up pretty quickly. 
We have the ability to pull resources from where we need it to make sure that priorities get addressed. Um, all of our clients should feel like they are our only client and we service them with all of the attention that we can. However, we're cognizant of costs and we try and make sure that we don't put somebody, like I don't need to be you know, uh, folding plans for lack of a better term. We're not gonna be charging clients for things that they don't need to be paying for. So we're cognizant of their time and money. We're cognizant of the, the pressures they're under and we just try and service our clients on a boutique basis as best we can. We can bob and weave. We're small enough that we can allocate resources quickly and seems to be working for us. So the growth is great. Lots of new things on the horizon. I just see more growth happening. Offering urban design as part of our suite of services is a big one. Um, so yeah, anybody can call us. We're happy to give you some of our time up front to see how we can help you and make sure you're comfortable with us and we're comfortable with you as a client. Before we wrap up and, and, and share with people how they can find you, what the easiest way to get in touch with you or the company is. And I, and I didn't plan on asking you this question, but now I feel like I want to. <laughs> I'm calling an audible and tell me if you can't for client confidentiality. But uh, people always ask me what my career highlights are from a project perspective of what I've been involved in. And, and my first quick answer is always be Mo Field. That'll always be my baby. Um, and as the years go on, the stories grow grander of what I actually did there in my head, right? <laughs> PCL built that building. Um, some great architects or architects designed it. My boss, Bob Hunter, really created that relationship. But yeah, I was the opening general manager and hired the staff and, and did a lot of the change orders and the FF and E for the stadium. And, and I think by the time I'm 80, I'm going to be telling people I got I'm Danny Dicchio and I got the first goal <laughs> for DFC. But it's it's certainly a highlight for me. I can I can point to that. I can point to um, you know John Sleeman's business at the Metalworks. Now I did a deal there to get him in there on the commercial side. Um, do you have a hit like a top hit list that you you could share project wise just for people in the industry who are listening? Yeah, there's there every project we work on has something interesting about it that's different than another project. Every project is different. And just in terms of some really cool stuff we've worked on, um, we, we basically, it's under construction right now. Uh, we did get all the approvals on a 650 home subdivision in Caledon East. So that's uh, currently being constructed. If anybody's driving through Caledon East, it's east side of Airport Road, just south of the food land, south of Old Church. So that, that's a pretty good project, pretty cool. We designed it from scratch on a, on a blank farmer's field, so to speak. So anybody living in that community, hopefully, uh, you know, we, we did it in the right way, but that's, that's a pretty cool project we worked on. Uh, we work on a golf course community up in Owen Sound. Uh, oh. That's, that's run by a really great family. And uh, it's been a real joy to work on. It's got different components to it. We're dealing with the commercial aspects of the golf course. We're dealing with the residential components being um, just the, you know, the ongoing phases of residential development. There's existing residents, there's new residents coming in, single detached, townhouse developments, condo freehold, good variety in there. So it's a really cool project to work on. Uh, they run the their most, annual Conquer. Is that one of the most picturesque golf courses in Ontario that I've never played on that I really want to play on <laughs> you're referring to? Yeah, that's, that's it, it, the, the scenery and the setting is just spectacular. Yeah. Uh, the family, uh, the, the, Patriarch Willis McLeese, who uh, bought the property and started the project, really had some foresight into that. And it uh, seems to be going well. They're down into the third generation now of, uh, of family. So they're doing, they're doing really well. Great family to work with. Um, and then we work on some really, really cool projects. We just finished all the approvals for the Scott Mission in downtown Toronto on Spadina. So that's a, a project providing some deeply affordable housing to... Uh, essentially transition people from a, a homeless atmosphere into uh, really affordable, you know, you're talking probably in the in dollars per night type of residential uh, setting, hopefully transitioning into something they can get on their feet, get back into um, uh, better housing as a transition, but really cool project right down at Spadina, just south of the uh, U of T architecture department. Um, so those are those are three of the highlights. We work on many projects. We're doing a, 
30 story building in, we're working on providing the planning services for a 30 story building in Brampton, uh, 11 story condo in Toronto, uh, redevelopment of a plaza site in Mississauga. Very, very cool projects to work on. Uh, a lot of fun. Our website is just currently being updated right now with more of the content, some newer projects. And we will be working on a, a website coming into uh, the next year. But anybody can go on our website now and see a broader cross-section of the projects we worked on. Those are just a few off the top of my head. Amazing, that'll lead us into my last question and then maybe we'll wrap up with your generous time allocation for us this evening. But where does someone find TJ and find DPS? Yeah, so I mean, our, go to our website. All our contact information is there. We're in the West End of Toronto, as you mentioned earlier in, in Etobicoke. Uh, but we service all of Ontario. Um, I'm, if someone said, where do I find you? I would say in my office. I used <laughs> okay. to call it Disneyland because I was there so much. I was having so much fun. Uh, tonight, I just happen to do this podcast from home because I wanted to make sure after I have my pint, I don't have to get in my car Smart. and drive home. Can, but, can, uh, are, you, are you open to LinkedIn connections if someone wanted to connect? You're yeah, you can search search for me on LinkedIn. Um, Design Plan Services has a LinkedIn presence, uh, Instagram, Twitter, um, and and just through our website. We like to do a lot of stuff in person. Our business is very uh, unique to each landowner. It's not as if we can just offer you know if you want to buy ten widgets, go to our website and buy right. them. Right. No, our our service is tailor made to each client. So give us a call. Uh, we'll get back, one of our planners will get back to you uh, or myself, depending on workload and uh, resources on, at the time, okay. try and get back to everybody quickly. Uh, we're at designplan.ca. That's our website. Okay. And, and phone uh, number? like I said, office in, in Toronto. You got a phone number top of mind or will they find that on your website? Yeah, it's on our website, but it's the same phone number we've had since 1983. And it's uh, Toronto based 416-626-5445. <laughs> Six two six four one six six two six five four four five five four four five. That was for yeah. those of are listening to the audio of the podcast and not seeing the video. When he said nineteen eighty three, I was dialing in the good old rotary. Remember those? I'm aging myself now. Oh yeah, good times yeah. back then. I tell you. Happy days, literally. Um, yeah. Awesome. TJ, this has been great. I, I really recommend people check TJ out. Um, you know, the beauty of my business is I work across multiple industries uh, and I find these tremendous leaders in these pockets that you'd never expect. Uh, TJ is certainly one of them. Although he's got his own company and running it super well, he could be the CEO of any organization I've worked with. Um, he does that good a job with his team and is doing that well with his business. Um, and people who are associated with you are lucky to do so. So keep up the fantastic work. And I'll even say that when you're not a client anymore. I promise you've been doing an amazing job. No, I appreciate that. I appreciate you having me on. Um, I know I'm following Mocan, so that was a, a tough <laughs> act to follow. It is. He's, he set the bar high, but uh, you know, a lot of your podcasts have been with some really phenomenal leaders. So it's, uh, it's a privilege to be on here. Thanks very much. Awesome. I appreciate it, TJ. All the best to you and the family. Great. Thanks very much.